started. So for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Kirsten Olland. I run the psychiatry residency program here, and we are delighted to have one of our very own, one of our chief residents, Dr. Mariah Rassico, who will be presenting for us today. Um, she did her undergraduate in medical anthropology um, at the University of Montana, and then did medical school training at Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine. She is in our uh, UW-Idaho psychiatry residency track um, and is what we call a fast tracker. So she's completing her adult training in three years instead of four so that she can move on to child and adolescent psychiatry training starting in July of 2021. And she matched at Oregon Health Science University. That's correct, right? Okay, <laughs> just double checking on that one, which I know was one of her top choices, so that's wonderful. Um, and she's here with us today. She's gonna talk about um, professionalism and medical training and kind of the differences between our ideals that we have and what happens in practice. So we will let her share that with us. And thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Rassico. Thank you, Dr. Holland. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm gonna share this screen. Um, pull up my presentation. Does everyone see that? Good. Okay. Um, okay. So I am going to be talking about professionalism and medical training, like uh, Dr. Allen said. And um, so I'm so sorry. My mouse keeps disappearing. So if I look like I'm lost and trying to do something, there's something weird happening to my computer. Um, so just first to outline the goals of this talk, um, first and foremost, to define professionalism in medicine, to define the hidden curriculum, to identify how professionalism is enforced and evaluated, um, and to explore the impact of bias on the de definition and evaluating professionalism, as well as to propose ways that we could reduce that, that introduction of bias via subjectivity. Um, I know that sounds like a lot, but the first couple will go quick, hopefully. Um, here's just an outline of, of what we'll be talking about. So why I'm interested in professionalism, what I think professionalism is. I'm so sorry. This like mouse just is totally gone and I'm trying to like move the faces. Um, why professionalism? What is professionalism? Um, how we use it sort of as a catch-all for a lot of... I didn't get that. Oh my Could God. you try again? <laughs> okay, one second. There we go. All right, Siri is not needed and we're gonna keep moving on. Okay, um, what can we do to decrease the gap between how professionalism is defined and how it's used? Um, and how can we encourage a safe learning environment that fosters professional identity formation and professionalism? Um, so this is a picture of me. I'm the dorky child in the front there. And then behind me is my mom. Um, and then on either side of us are um, two folks who worked with her. So this is at Flathead, um, the Flathead Reservation, where my mom worked as a diabetes doctor when I was young. And so she's worked with IHS for her whole career. Um, and I, in coming to medical school, this was the foundation for me um, knowing what a doctor's office looked like and sort of what professionalism looked like. So I used to go with my mom to work and I would play under the table um, during meetings and sometimes play with other patients' kids or other kids um, of people who worked there and people would feed babies at work and all the sorts of those things. And so that is the context from which I'm, I'm coming, a much different sense of sort of what is professional than I think um, I've seen in training and what, what we see now. And so that got me interested in the topic. Also, um, when I was in medical school, um, my medical school had a program, had a, a board that I think most schools now do. Um, it's either called like the professionalism board or the progress board. Um, and it's essentially a disciplinary board that monitors whether medical students are um, attaining the goals that they need to professionally in order to keep continuing through the program. Um, my school developed this form and oh my gosh, you'll see, it's actually, this says the School of Dentistry Professionalism Monitoring Form. And I, I reached out to the Dean of Students at my medical school to ask for the School of Medicine Professionalism Monitoring Form. And he refused to give it to me and said it was so universally despised by the students um, that they are implementing something new. Um, but 
the, the crux of this form was that we were encouraged to report one another for unprofessional behavior, um, which is what I sort of tongue in cheek called medical school McCarthyism. So we were essentially insist, like encouraged to snitch on one another. And on a, obviously there are like situations in which this makes sense. So you see, a, you know, uh, another medical student cheating, or you see another medical student doing something, you know, treating a nurse really poorly or something like that. Um, unfortunately, how it often got used was um, for people who were sort of non-conforming to the culture, for people who weren't well liked in terms of personality, and it became sort of this petty tool where you could get each other in trouble. Um, so why are we talking about this? Why does it matter? Um, there is a, a body of evidence that shows that, well, first of all, one of the main reasons that people are dismissed from either medical school or residency training um, is primarily most of those are due to unprofessional behavior. And there's sort of a wide variety of what's defined in that. Um, and then there's actually some really interesting, they did this interesting case control study where they looked at 270 physicians who were in practice who had had some sort of lapse in professionalism. And they... Um, looked back through their histories and they matched them with controls who didn't have, you know, licensing um, issues or those sorts of things and found that people who had professional professionalism lapses as attendings were very light, were three times more likely to have had unprofessional concerns all the way along their training. Um, and so there is some concern that, that there's a pattern here and that um, catching it early can be helpful. In terms of defining professionalism, so um, I think there's a general sort of cultural sense of what professionalism is, and there's a very specific sense in medicine. And I, I read essentially five or six papers on this and two textbooks, and they basically all outline the same history. And I think it's important to note that that history is all through a Western medical lens, and, and not just that, but sort of a white English-speaking European lens. Um, and no one sort of mentioned you know, the traditions of medicine in, in other settings. And so I think we're starting with a definition that is, um, has some bias. So I think that's important to note. Um, so this fancy fellow here in the right hand side um, is Thomas Percival, who in 1803 wrote a book called Medical Ethics um, that was groundbreaking in which he essentially was, they think, the first person to say that medicine was a profession. And one of the things that he did was lay the foundation for a social contract between physicians and patients um, and said that uh, professionalism and our accountability is a collective responsibility instead of an individual responsibility, which was a big frame shift. Um, it wouldn't be another about 100 years before you started seeing professionalism mentioned more in literature, so in the early 1900s. Um, there's some really interesting stuff there about the tension between medical profession and capitalism and corporatization um, that I don't really have time to get into, but if you're kind of a history nerd, I would, I would look that stuff up because it's cool. Um, but it really wasn't until the 1990s that we see this huge uptick in essentially a professionalism movement in medicine and talking about what professionalism is. And this graph that is unfortunately a little bit cut off here in the bottom right hand corner um, just shows how there's essentially no, on the left hand side, that there's no papers basically mentioning professionalism until 1990 you start to see an uptick and then this the graph only goes to 2012 or 2013. But there's this huge increase. Um, and so in all of that, um, there was the creation of the Physician Charter of Medical Professionalism. And this has been accepted by 300 professional medical associations worldwide. It's sort of well-established to be the pillars of professionalism um, for, for medicine. And those three things on the left-hand side are sort of the crucial, the crucial bits. Um, so the primacy of patient welfare that includes altruism, trust, patient interest, um, patient autonomy, so honesty with patients, the need to educate and empower our patients, and then social justice, um, which they defined as referring to both the social contract of the physician as well as distributive justice. So are we allocating resources appropriately um, and trying to meet the needs of the many rather than the needs of the few? Um, and then the more sort of specific things are listed there on the right in the charter, 
I'm not going to read those all out, but they're sort of the things that you would think of like competence, honesty, integrity, confidentiality, responsibility, um, all of which I think you'd be hard pressed to find a doctor who doesn't agree um, that those things are the cornerstone of professionalism in medicine. However, they're a little bit vague, right? Um, we can all say, I want to be responsible to my patients, but what does that actually mean in practice? Um, and then just, sorry, just to um, go over the, on the left-hand side here is from the ACGME, which is the, um, the residency council. They made professionalism a competency. So we have to prove that we are professionally competent before we can graduate. And these are essentially echoing the physician charter um, with, I think that one important thing to note here is the demonstrate sensitivity and responsiveness to patients' culture, age, gender, and disabilities. Um, and on the right here is an attempt by the University of Texas Southwestern to make those that sort of great sounding, but a little bit esoteric uh, competency into something more concrete. So responsibility, are you arriving on time? Are you accepting blame for your failures? Um, you know, are you making inappropriate demands? Those sorts of things, not being abusive. Um, but I think there's still room for subjectivity in here. If we look at like communication skills is not loud or disruptive, like that's subjective. I mean, I think there are certain situations in which we can say, okay, that's loud and that's definitely disruptive, but there is some nuance there. Um, so it's important to note that this is, this is hard to pin down. And so that's what I wanna get into is the tension between these like pillars of professionalism, integrity and honesty, um, and how we're actually seeing it practiced and how we actually apply it. And I think um, a big part of that is the hidden curriculum, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide, um, but also things that play in there are personal lives versus professional lives, sort of standards of behavior, um, the sort of performance of professionalism, as well as um, the hierarchy, which I think is a big part of medical training as well. So the hidden curriculum is well described in a lot of literature. Um, there's a book called Understanding Medical Professionalism that I think many of the attendings have. It's actually a really great textbook about professionalism, if any of you are interested. Um, and they have a whole chapter actually dedicated to it. The hidden curriculum is something we all understand sort of intuitively, which is there's a formal curriculum in any training situation, but there is also this hidden expectations. Um, of behavior and performance that are not explicitly stated, but are implicitly stated. Um, and that is informed by the culture of the organization, by the norms and values of the culture at large. Um, and so this is a lot more nuanced and obviously, I think just by its nature, opens the door for a little bit more subjectivity. I've also included a picture here of sardine salad uh, to remind me of a sort of example of the hidden curriculum. So when I was on my third year of medical school, I was in a rotation for internal medicine with a, uh, another student. And we were in the VA in Portland and we were in a illegally converted closet that had no ventilation for our workroom. Um, and that no ventilation piece is important. And every day my medical student six days a week brought sardine salad and ate it at lunch, um, which if you're in like a small room with no ventilation is pretty smelly. Um, and like, yes, it was smelly. We all got through it. It was fine. Um, at one point when he was out of the room, um, I overheard the residents, what I assumed was joking, talking about writing him up for professionalism for his salad. Um, and I later learned from that student that they had actually submitted a professionalism form on him for eating food that they found smelly, um, which I think we can all think about like the ways that that could be weaponized against people with a different culture, with food that you are not familiar with, but also that's pretty petty. Um, like maybe we don't need to risk people's careers over salads. Um, so that's an example of the hidden curriculum. Should he have known that his residents maybe weren't into him eating a smelly salad in the room every day? Potentially. Um, and the expectation was from them that he should know. Um, so professionalism is maybe not the most popular thing amongst trainees and medical students. Um, multiple uh, 
papers have, have been written about this. Actually, all three of these papers are from 2020. Um, and my favorite one referred to professionalism as the P word amongst medical students and trainees um, because they felt it was so repressive and weaponized. Um, others indicated that even if it's used, if it's been put in place with the best intentions, it can be used as a tool for social control and can cause unintended harm. And I think the really crucial one for, for my talk is that first one, which is talking about how medical students are caught in between um, mixed messages. So they hear these formal curriculum messages about what a great doctor is, and then they're actually seeing things on the ground level that maybe are mismatch and how to integrate those two um, while still getting good grades and still getting into residency or still getting a job and those sorts of things. Um, it's a big ask. So I think, I think I kind of touched on this already with the sardine salad. Is it always a question of professionalism? Probably not. There are some things that we don't like that other people do or that we don't even think are appropriate in training, but they maybe don't rise to the, to the level of unprofessional. Um, one thing that comes to mind is uh, in my medical school, if you didn't complete your evaluations of attendings on time, uh, that was considered a, a doc against your professionalism, which may or may not be appropriate, but then that was actually going to go in your dean's letter that goes to all of the residencies you're applying to um, as saying you're unprofessional, which again is, is sort of weaponizing a pretty small thing. Um, which is potentially inappropriate. And I think part of the problem here is that we in, in medicine have done some, some interesting sort of black and white thinking here where we've said, it's not that you've behaved unprofessionally, it's that you're unprofessional. It's not that you've done something bad, it's that you're bad. And so it's a very, it's a very like sort of hefty accusation for someone to call you unprofessional instead of it being sort of a growing opportunity. And I think that's one of the issues as well. Brian, may I ask a question? Yeah. Were attendings held to the same standard? <laughs> no. Which I think is also part of the problem, right? We, you have a, a very real example of them not being held to that same standard. Um, so I think, I don't wanna be down on professionalism though. I think um, there are absolute, it's absolutely an integral part of training um, and being a, a doctor. I think, of course, we want to encourage honesty and integrity and responsibility, accountability, and all those things. And I think it can be used in a really positive way. And so some examples of that are um, using the sort of social justice pieces to say we are both advocates for the individual patient in front of us, as well as patients in general. Um, we absolutely should be monitoring each other and making sure we're being respectful of all providers around us, all staff around us, um, and that that was not always the case with medicine, and I'm sure it isn't now still, um, but should be, and should be what we're striving towards. Um, questions of patient safety, um, questions of appropriate resource allocation. And actually recently, there's been a, a big movement for using professionalism to institute anti-racism and anti-discrimination within programs. And actually the University of Washington today, this morning, sent out um, their new bias reporting tool. And they have a task force who's looking into incidents of bias. Um, and I think that's a great example of, we are beholden to preventing instances of racism and discrimination um, and using professionalism for that. I also, there's an example of that pr uh, progress board in my medical school being really useful. There was a, a medical student a couple years above me who, uh, presented to multiple rotations intoxicated and at one point was intoxicated and followed an, a female attending into the bathroom and she felt quite threatened. Um, obviously that's unprofessional behavior if not potentially like illegal um, and, and should be dealt with. And so I think there's absolutely a, a reason that we have professionalism and that we talk about it. Um, I just think it's also, um, there is potential for reinforcing bias if we're not careful. And so some of the examples I'm going to talk about are the risks of that subjectivity and the risks of using the hidden curriculum um, to evaluate bias. And these are, this is not a comprehensive list at all. This is just some examples I was able to find. Um, so I'm going to go over some sexism, some classism, anti-LGBTQ, and racism. 
So first off, sexism. And I know that we just had Eunice as Grand Rounds and there, she talked quite a bit about sexism and um, in medicine. And so there's plenty of examples there, but I'm not sure some of you may have heard about this. This is a New York Times headline saying women's doctor, women doctors ask who decides what's professional and was part of this whole hashtag med bikini uh, movement, which I tried to find pictures for this for and um, some of them are fairly racy, so I didn't include them. Um, but, but this is the title of the article that was produced and it was, it's been retracted. It's prevalence of unprofessional social media content among young vascular surgeons. So for those of you who don't know, this was published online in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2019. And then it was set to be published in print last August when sort of this whole storm came up about it. Um, it was, it's a, a paper, so, the, so those principal authors, there's seven of them, six of whom are men. They instructed um, an all male fellow, so all vascular surgery fellows to do this research. They were instructed to create neutral fake social media profiles with which to spy on other young vascular surgeons without their consent. Um, and then they looked at 235 profiles of people who they knew were vascular surgeons and assessed their social media presence for unprofessional behavior. And where the real issue, if you don't think this is an issue already, um, the real issue comes in is what they defined as unprofessional. Um, and they used uh, some criteria that had been published in the very early 2000s, um, but has never been validated and, and isn't really well agreed upon. Some of the things that they considered unprofessional um, included unprofessional or provocative clothing like bikinis, um, but they did not include sort of male swim trunks, uh, holding alcohol, holding beers, and also commenting on controversial political topics like gun control and abortion access. Um, and so a lot of the pushback was it's sexist. So men in bathing suits are not unprofessional, but women in bathing suits is unprofessional. Um, and, and this concept of it's not political as a doctor to talk about gun control, that's, that's advocacy and within our scope, same with abortion access as abortion providers. Um, and so there was a lot of pushback. This is just a sampling of like the least racy photos I could find of, <laughs> of the pushback um, of people saying like, is it unprofessional to have a personal life? And I think that this is, um, an important question and it's one that we all have to grapple with and I think as psychiatrists we maybe and in mental health care we we maybe grapple with a little bit more um the question of do we get to sort of clock off and be ourselves in the community an example of that maybe not during COVID times but is you know Boise is a fairly small town is it reasonable for one of us to go drink downtown and what if we get a little tipsy and what if a patient sees us is that unprofessional or is that just us living our lives and we're off the clock and so i think that discussion has a lot of nuance um, that is not well addressed in this paper and that's part of why it was retracted um, in terms of classism so i think this is something we don't necessarily think a lot about in medicine and um, i think we think about it in terms of our patients but not maybe in our colleagues and this is from 2018, it's about the 2017 income brackets. Um, it's a graph published by the American College of um, Association of American Medical Colleges. Um, and it's about the sort of income makeup of medical students. So that big, huge orange bar on the right hand side there is the percentage of medical student, first year medical students who come from the top fifth quintile, the top 20% of income, so their parents essentially, or whomever they grew up with. And that hash, hatched bar is actually people who come from the top 5%. And so if you actually, if you include the top two, so 40%, the top 40% of the income brackets in this country, um, over 90% of medical students are actually from that group. And what that means, uh, I think we can all, uh, Align with the fact that that means that there is a huge uh, shift towards the medical students that we are working with and residents being from wealthy families and that that 
obviously impacts the experience. So, you know, who's able to do unpaid internships to get experience so that they know what medical school is like and what being a doctor is like? Who is able to pay out of pocket for test prep materials um, so they do better on tests? Um, who's able to buy new fancy clothes so that they look extra professional on wards? Um, and so I think that that piece is something we don't talk about a whole lot. Um, and these next couple of slides are talking about appearance. I don't think that appearance and sort of classism are, are sort of a one-to-one -one equal, um, but it felt like this is where this fit best. Um, and I do think they're related. So there are all these studies looking about at what patients want their doctors to look like. And I think um, none of them that I found looked specifically at psychiatry. And I think that this might be a little bit different if you talk to mental health patients in certain settings. Um, just due to the history there. But um, most people want their doctors to be in white coats. Um, again, maybe not in psychiatry, a little hard to know. Um, but formal sort of attire with a white coat is preferred, um, which I think for many doctors is sort of disappointing. Um, they did say that they want surgeons to be in scrubs, so they get to wear scrubs and maybe ER physicians, but everyone else should be in a white coat. Um, just an aside, I had in medical school an attending say that we should be dry cleaning our white coat at least once a week, um, which I think is also, again, like a disconnect between the finances of a medical student as well as the time suck of a medical student. Um, versus in attending and or yeah um so just things to think about i one place that sort of this hits home for is i have, i have tattoos many of you probably know that um it actually studies show that 40 percent of adults in the u.s now have tattoos um so it's no longer sort of um relegated to a specific group of people but there's actually so a lot of uh studies that had people look at pictures of doctors, so that they rated tattooed providers as sort of less competent, less trustworthy. But this study um, was actually quite a large study that looked at, um, it actually had providers in the ER wear fake tattoos. Um, and then after seeing, after 900 interactions with those fake tattoos, they assessed, um, they had patients fill out surveys and assessed how they felt about their doctors. And what they found was that no one really cared um, by like a huge margin. Um, and so this doctor here on the left is the quote unquote most tattooed doctor in the world. She's a surgical resident in Australia who is essentially covered head to toe, has finger tattoos, neck tattoos. Um, and has been pretty outspoken about the stigma she faces and largely not from patients who don't seem to mind quite as much. So just an interesting thing to think about um, because I think we historically say tattoos are unprofessional and there are certainly parts of the country where that would still be the case. Um, so in terms of anti-LGBTQ um, discrimination, so this is requiring a little bit of a leap because as far as I could tell, there was there's not much data on that being weapon, that identity being weaponized from a professionalism standpoint. But my argument is that if you, if trainees are out about their LGBTQ identity, um, they're at risk for biased evaluations from, from people who have both explicit and implicit um, bias. And that when you are filling out a form, that has very specific competencies about medical things. And then at the bottom says, was this student unprofessional or professional? And it's sort of a narrative box um, that that's where that bias can really come out. And so this was a, a small study of transgender and non-binary medical providers across all um, levels of training. Um, it's a pretty small study, I think in part, um, just because there's still quite a bit of stigma in that community with coming out. Um, so they only had 40 respondents, but 78% of them said that they censored their speech or mannerisms at least half of the time to avoid unintentional disclosure um, for fear of disclosure. This next um, talks about this one body of research um, from Dr. Street, who looked at a huge number of, let's see, it was um, like 600 respondents um, 
again, across all training levels who um, identified as LGBT. Um, and the numbers are pretty, so they compared these numbers, this was in 2017, they compared them to numbers in 2007. Um, and there's really no difference. So 15% of people who were openly gay said that they were harassed by a colleague. 10% said they were denied referral by colleagues and 22% felt socially ostracized. I mean, these are pretty, I think we come from um, a place where we, we like to think that we're a little bit more liberal part of the country, a little bit more progressive, maybe not Idaho in general, but Boise um, and our program. And, and this thing, this stuff is really still happening. Um, and I think it's important to be aware of. Um, again, like I said, not necessarily proof that there's unprofessional, that there's, this is being uh, uh, addressed under the umbrella of professionalism, but I think it's likely that it is. And one of the examples here is I have, this is a picture of a, a med student, a friend of mine. Um, I have blacked out his face so that he's not a part of this, um, but he does know I'm using this picture. Um, so this is what he wore. This is the type of clothing he wore every day on our rotation. It was also an inpatient medicine rotation often wearing a white shirt or a blue shirt, not a purple shirt, but regardless, that's what he was wearing. And in his feedback, um, he was told you dress too feminine, which I think we can all look at that outfit and say that's mm, like objectively not true. That's like a tie and slacks and a button down. Even if it were, that's a problematic statement. Um, but regardless, he felt it was a coded message and I did as well, that he was too feminine, that he was too effeminate. Um, he's an openly gay man. He at times uses phrases or mannerisms that are more traditionally seen as feminine. Um, and this was in Oregon in the late 2000 teens, right? So this is, I think this stuff is still happening. And this, um, he kind of tried to fight this and really didn't get any support behind it. Um, so racism. And this, I think each of these could, could be their own talk. There are so many examples of our professional culture and especially the hidden curriculum centering whiteness in part because that's medicine is traditionally a white heterosexual cisgender male field, um, but that is changing. And um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research and discussion out there about the way that this is used um, to sort of weaponized against people of color. Um, this is an example. So the one I'm going to use is one that I think many of us are probably familiar with, which is the natural hair discrimination that happens for, um, black folks in, in our professional settings. So this is a Google search comparing if you search unprofessional hairstyles versus professional hairstyles, I think we can all see a bit of a theme here and what's happening. Um, which is, you know, I, I think this has been well described. If you haven't heard about it, there's some really great things out there that talk about it. I think the most, for me, the most convincing are, um, are anecdotal stories um, to support that research. And so one of them I wanted to read to you is from a, a physician. She is a first year dermatology resident at Harvard. She attended the University of Illinois, Chicago, um, where she had two experiences um, they were pretty overt about her hair. Um, the first one was during her second year of medical school. She had a practicum. The doctor gave her um, a great grade until the professionalism box, at which point she wrote unsatisfactory, but didn't leave any notes about what that meant. The student went to her and asked what, what she was talking about. Um, and she said, um, if, if you would only wash your hair, that would be better. Um, and she said, I, I do wash my hair. And she said, no, but so that it comes out straight. Um, and she said, it comes out of my head curly. Uh, and this doctor was like, I'm not trying to you know, upset you. I'm just saying um, it's unprofessional. So the school was very supportive. They removed that grade. They um, stopped sending students to that attending. But even just later on, she had a research mentor who's also an attending who I'm, I'm going to read this conversation because I think it'll, it'll, um, it's more poignant that way. So she said, well, Dr. L, to be honest. Oh, so she said, patients would be scared of hair like yours. 
And she said, well, to be honest, if patients are scared of hair like mine, I think I'm doing a service by wearing it like this more often. This is the way that many Black women's hair looks naturally, so they need to get used to it. The attending said, getting used to it's one thing, but there's a standard for professionalism. I would also comment if a man wore his hair in a man bun or a girl wore her, her hair dyed blue. The student obviously said, there's a big difference between dyeing your hair blue and wearing your hair the way that it comes out of your head. Um, also, I think us in Idaho at least don't feel that negatively towards man buns, but maybe that's different in Chicago. Um, and the attending said, um, said, I'm not sure I follow you, these are just standards. This is what professionalism looks like. It's straight hair, not big hair. Um, and so I think, I mean, this is this is happening two years ago in Chicago. Like this isn't um, a thing of the past. This isn't the 1970s. This is very real discrimination that happens for folks. Um, they're being told that the way they look naturally because they're not white and don't have white hair is unprofessional. Um, and we know that this has an impact. So minority medical students, racial minority medical students um, just consistently receive lower grades than their white peers. So these are actually from two different studies. On the left there um, is a study called Making the Grade, where they looked at 2,400 medical students' clinical scores. So this is not narrative. This is um, like actual just like letter grades and number grades. Um, and they found that um, race and ethnicity and underrepresentative medicine is what that URM stands for, were likely to, to report lower grades in every single clerkship across the board. And this is at four different medical schools. Um, and, and that was a statistically significant um, difference. They're also, the one on the right here is a really interesting study um, that looks at narrative descriptors um, of a medical student performance based on gender, based on, um, uh, underrepresented in medicine. It's a little hard to read this graph and kind of understand it out of context, but essentially these are the types of words used to describe someone based on whether they got honors or just a pass, based on whether they're part of an underrepresented in medicine versus not. Um, and there's a huge difference in the way that those words, in the way that what words come up. Um, Non-white students are much more likely to be described with um, words like competent, um, versus sort of outstanding, excellent, impressive type of words. Um, it's also really interesting from a, from a gender perspective, what words are more commonly used for women versus men, things like empathetic, nurturing, compassionate, being a much more common with women. Um, it's a really interesting study. It looks at 90,000 clerkship evaluations, um, this algorithm. So it's pretty comprehensive. Um, but I think it's something to, to think about um, in the way that we evaluate medical students, especially in it from a narrative standpoint, um, are we allowing an, an implicit bias to come into the room? Um, and what this also means is that minority, we know that minority students are at higher risk for dismissal from training. And I found this pretty surprising, it, not that fact, but the fact that it is very hard to find data about medical students or residents um, being dismissed or terminated. Um, there are not a lot of papers out there. There's not a lot of info out there about it. Um, part of that may be that a lot of people who are essentially dismissed are asked to resign. Um, so it doesn't look like a dismissal. Um, either way, from the data that is available, people are more likely to be dismissed if they were identified as a problem resident. Um, I like that this is an actual like term that sort of is amongst program directors, maybe Dr. Allen can tell us if she she identifies problem residents also. Um, but <laughs> but they're, they're, medical, they're residents who, um, for whatever reason, are disruptive or have many professionalism issues. And there, there's this whole paper about separating fixable problems from unfixable problems. And the unfixable problems um, most often fell under the category of unprofessional behavior or communication issues. Um, and consistently, both in internal medicine and emergency medicine, residents who are older than 35, who are international medical graduates, or who were from an underrepresented minority, were at much higher risk for being identified as a problem resident. Um, oh, sorry. Um, then, so there's this 
the only data I could find on actual people who'd been dismissed is based on a big survey um, from the late 1990s and early 2000s about surgical residency. Um, in this study, it's actually from a whole book about this, three, about three out of every 100 residents was dismissed. I think that's probably not the case. Um, I would guess that surgery has a higher percentage of that than maybe some other specialties. Um, but they, they found that non-white men were 8.7 times more likely and non-white women were 9.87 times more likely to be terminated than their white male counterparts controlling for other things. Um, so this is, this does matter. We know that there are actually very um, concrete sequela to, to this sort of bias of professionalism, this bias of being identified as a problem resident. It can actually have a huge impact on career trajectory. And so the ultimate question I think um, is, so we, we see that this, the way that we are evaluating professionalism is often based on a hidden curriculum instead of sort of this overt, were they an honest person? Were they, you know, did they have integrity in the way they dealt with patients? And if that's the case, how can we, how can we reduce the subjectivity so that we can help prevent bias from coming into the room? Obviously we can't prevent bias entirely. And I think there are efforts to, um, to do sort of education or with faculty, with staff, with whomever about um, about how to recognize your own biases and how to check those biases. And that's an important part. But what are some other things that are more specific that we can do? Um, I think one of the most important ones is really, really settling on if we're going to define professionalism by those pillars of professional behavior that we talked about before, how can we operationalize those into actual behaviors um, in a way that makes them less subjective? So if we're saying, does being responsible, and I think each, you know, every scenario kind of needs to set that information for themselves and, and decide what they're going to hold both their faculty and their students and residents to. Um, you know, accountability to patients, I think we all would hope that that doesn't mean 24 seven, you are responsible for responding to your patients. Um, but what does that mean? How often are you responsible and, and when and um, what that setting looks like. And so, and measuring whether trainees are, are living up to that. Um, having really precise and clear language in codes of conduct and in um, sort of codes of dress. And this is, I felt a little bit like I backed myself into a corner with this one. I, I'm just gonna come out and say, I hate wearing my white coat. I wore it once um, for a picture at the beginning of residency and I've never worn it again. Um, and also in doing this, I do think it's possible that it could serve as sort of a, a equalizing in the same way that sometimes um, school uniforms do, right? That um, students who are unable for whatever reason to have more professional dress, um, it doesn't matter as much if you have a white coat over it. In fact, um, at OHSU, there is an attending who frequently wears her like biking leotard under her white coat and just buttons it over it to see patients. And they obviously don't know, they're just, you know, they just see the white coat and her shoes. Um, and so I think that that's a possibility is, is um, as just one way to sort of reduce that gap in the way that we, um, and to be really clear about what professional dress looks like. That being said, I think in psychiatry that might have some negative sequela with patients. Um, it also, there are plenty of studies out of the UK showing that they can be like uh, germ vectors, which is kind of gross. Um, so maybe not the best solution, but something to think about. Um, my preference would be that we would think about how we define professionalism, not, not those sort of ideals of professionalism, but how the hidden curriculum actually supports um, sort of a white heteronormative um, standard. And if that's what we want to continue with, then is it reasonable to accept some change to that? Is it, is it reasonable to open the doors to the idea that professionalism could look different? Um, and I think that's a, a much bigger conversation and, and probably one that will be happening slowly over time. Um, but, I, but I do, I think one way we can do it is as individuals, when we are doing evaluations, we can really bring that into the room for ourselves and say, is this actually unprofessional behavior? 
or is this just not what I'm used to? Um, and I think acknowledging that this is hard um, and that it's not gonna be fixed overnight. Um, but being, I think, being aware that a lot of our expectations of trainees come from um, sort of implicit things that they may not know about is such a crucial, um, a crucial part of this because it's pretty hard to be evaluated on things that no one's ever told you. Um, it requires a lot of, of sort of keen observation that, that some folks are much more ad advantaged for than others. Um, so that's my talk. I don't know why my reference slide isn't showing up. Um, I'm sorry. I will add it on before I send it out. But um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Well, this is Kirsten. I just want to say thank you for that. I mean, it's a really important thing to think about. I had one comment and one question. Um, we thought about this a bit as a faculty about a year ago and came, decided, you know, how can we ensure that we're looking at professionalism on a continuum, kind of to your point of not saying someone is professional or unprofessional, but that there are domains within professionalism that people grow clinically and professionally in their residency training. So we put together this, I don't know if this was the right way to do it or not, but we put together this, um, uh, this tool, kind of like a, a survey of the different domains of professionalism and then um, kind of what you would look at within each of those domains. And we had kind of a scoring to it, mostly because we wanted to write it up and publish it and see if this was a tool that's helpful in residency. But we, we thought we would go over it with the residents before we implemented the tool and then um, work with the residents for six months and then kind of score the residents and, and then talk about it with them at the end of the six months. And the hope was that it would kind of break it down into all these pieces to kind of get away from this, you're professional, or you're not professional, and kind of highlight ways that we all are growing as physicians and what are some things people could keep working on. And then that kind of fell down. But um, this, this talk is making me think about looking, you know, talking about with the faculty, looking at professionalism from that lens and being careful not to being careful to be aware of biases that can come in. So thank you for that. And then my question is not really related to that at all, but I was curious about what happened in the 1990s that all this literature started coming out. Was there a change in the workforce, like more women going into medicine at that time or more, more underrepresented minorities? Or do you have any thoughts about that? I, so I, I don't have a sense of anyone explicitly addressing why that happened. Um, I think both of those things probably played a role. I also think, um, you know, in, in sort of like academic medicine and research, there's like something will just start to gain momentum and it will snowball. And then everyone's like, oh, that's a great word. We're going to use that word. Um, you know, like social determinants of health are now structural determinants of health or sort of that thing. Um, so I think that was part of it. But I also, you know, in talking to my mom about her training in the 70s, um, there was a lot of really unprofessional behavior. Like, you know, people treating, I think the big one to me is like people being extremely inappropriate with the way that they treated other staff members, like physicians being really inappropriate with how they treated nursing staff and other staff and students. Um, and so I do wonder if some of that came from a, a sense of like, how do we um, sort of safeguard against this? Like, is this what we wanna be as a profession and how do we, how do we shift this, this sort of toxic nature of things? But that's just a guess, I don't know. All right, this is Heather Gula. It looks like Dr. Borgasani has a question. Oh. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna leave my uh, video off just in the interest of professionalism because I was on my elliptical while I listened to your talk and I really <laughs> enjoyed it. Uh, um, so, you know, it was a, a great talk and I think you identified at the end how difficult this is because what we really want to teach students and residents is to be mindful of their behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, I have two daughters and they will dislike me because I'm going to repeat this phrase to them often, which is every behavior has a consequence given the context. Mm -hmm. And this is true for everything. And what's really difficult is teaching people that the way you dress, what you eat, what you do always has a consequence. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that something's really wrong, mm -hmm. but it's hard to have that mindfulness and not all physicians are equally mindful. Sure. So what we really should be doing is promoting mindfulness in trainees to be aware mm -hmm. of the consequences of their actions. Mm 
yeah. and what a, how we could impact their professional and patient relations. I, I totally agree. I actually think um, that speaks to one of the things that comes up in the literature a lot, which is a lot of people saying, yeah, we're teaching professionalism, but a lot of this seems like they either know it or they don't. So like, are they aware of um, the fact that the, the, you know, the way they present themselves might impact their relationship with a, a patient? And I think that speaks to what you're talking about is like, how do we teach um, that mindfulness? How do we teach people to be aware that those things impact the relationship? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that like the way you're doing it is wrong, but how to be aware of it and how to incorporate it into, into how you are observing the interaction. Yeah. And I hope you never felt pressured to wear a white coat when you were working with me. I, I did not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for your attention. Um, and I think Heather, I will give my slides to Heather. So I, I will add that reference slide. Perfect. Thank right. you. Okay. Thanks.